I think I've said that number of rocks. I don't think I've had a frozen one, but I know they're big over over that end of the world. <laughs> yep, a frozen margarita is excellent. It's like a grown up slushy. <laughs> It is. <laughs> yeah. Well, welcome everybody to the Solid Ground live stream for Monday, February 6th. So nice to see you guys. Jody's not with us today. She had a last minute issue she had to take care of. So she's she'll be with us next Monday. But here we are. And David, you want to start us off with the little intro to Solid Ground? I would love to. I don't know where it is. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, maybe we can just do it from memory. <laughs> okay. Jody's the one who usually has that. Um, I could try. Okay. Uh, Solid Ground is a, a, a community of individuals who are concerned about the imposition of critical social justice, CSJ, aka Woke, um, in their workplace in their home, if they've got family members who have it, <laughs> in their school, wherever. Um, and we are committed to providing a space for people to come together, talk about these things, have civil dialogue, but also moan and bitch about it as well. I don't think that's in there. Um, and then <laughs> we, also, we also do a lot of peer support community groups um, for people to join because we're, we're really about giving people space to feel like they're not so much ostracized in these environments, that they are people who aren't necessarily going mad. And there's, um, yeah, there's hope. And there's, there's a community for people to sort of spread hope because we're fine back. <laughs> That's, That's absolutely it. great, yes. And then our disclaimer, it is not therapy. Oh, or yeah. <laughs> mm, and uh, I think the website is solidgroundsupport.com and I'll also put links in the description under this video. So if you want to follow the links, you can go to our locals through there and it's it's really inexpensive. I think it's five bucks a month to be in the in the chat and then that gets you access to the groups as well. So and how were y'all's groups last week? Uh, wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, really interesting, engaging discussion. The people are an absolute delight. And it's uh, it's just a pleasure. The time goes by very fast. It's an hour and a half, but it's, it's mm. fast. I don't remember how many people we had last week. I think maybe five the week before that. We had seven or eight, so it varies. Mm -hmm. But it's always a good discussion. Yeah, I feel the same. It's, it was a, There were four of us this week, and we just sort of um you know it, topics were flying off in all sorts of directions but it was just so nice to, to talk to people who are curious who want to explore things so i always look forward to it um yeah. yeah i missed my group this week and i had a sub host it was karen from from the community and she um i look forward to hearing from her how it went she's awesome so i'm sure it was great and um yeah i missed it because we were in new york city Without David, <laughs> Sorry, David. Oh. I wish you'd been there. <laughs> I heard you guys had a great time though. Um, yeah, I wish I'd been there. Yeah, we had a great Next time. time. Very buttoned down and professional. <laughs> Very. It's not yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was really fun to, to see people that like Jennifer just called me a head. <laughs> She's, you're, you're just a head again, but it, in person to actually see people in person that you've known for like I've known have we known each other for what two years three years I don't know how long <laughs> yeah yeah and so to see people in person and be like look how tall you are look what yeah. you look like in person <laughs> super cool yes very much so and that kind of segues nicely into what we were talking about discussing today which is community building community and how do you know who to, David, I love what you said, like, how do you know who to trust and how do you, how do you develop in such polarizing times? Yeah. Trusting connections. And yeah, would you, you want to elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, I was just thinking, I mean, I saw at the weekend, uh, it was the sort of second time I'd seen it, the debate between Douglas Murray, Matt Taibbi, I think, um, Math, um, Malcolm Gladwell and Michelle Goldberg or something, I think. Um, but they were 
discussing the sort of faith we have in the mainstream media and I just know personally I I do find myself um you know looking at a broad range of different outlets and or websites and YouTube channels and things and you know even still with all of the the fact that we try hard to think about our own biases and you know tr reducing tribalism we do still find ourselves watching things and then you know and then hearing a, a particular content creator saying something and thinking oh I'm not sure I agree with that oh gosh what does that mean about me that I'm listening to this stuff or I'm <laughs> on a diet of this stuff at the moment um and I guess just yeah knowing knowing really what it is we can reliably trust is for me getting harder and harder because as Douglas Murray says in the in the debate he says we don't have different different opinions anymore we have different facts mm -hmm. and that's that's the problem that we've got which is just it's not about what the truth is it's about what side is my side saying versus what's what, what what is the side that's being chatted to by my by my opposition and i think that's that's the problem we kind of face it's not an easy one to tackle but yeah that's really interesting um i think that that it is it does sometimes feel like there's narrative and counter narrative you know mm -hmm. like like you say that quote is very interesting about different facts instead of different opinions. What do you think about that, Jennifer? Oof. I think, unfortunately, that's very true. And um, this is part of why I don't really blame some people who are sort of, you know, not woke activists, but a bit woke around the edges, because they're responding to those different facts. And they're responding also to the I think kind of inflammatory nature of some of the things that are um, written in mainstream media. Mm -hmm. And so I think, well, if I, if I didn't expose myself to anything other than mainstream media, I may also have some of those some of those beliefs and reactions. Although I have to say, part of what drove me to look at other sources was the fact that mainstream media seemed, um, it seemed so histrionic to me in some ways. And I thought, wait, no, that, that bit there can't quite be true. Mm. Um, yeah, so man, it's hard. But in a way, I'm very grateful to mainstream media because it's actually how I discovered um, Jordan Peterson because the Washington Post, which is a paper I grew up with and always respected, they published this hit piece on him and just made him sound like the devil incarnate. Yeah. And I, so I got curious and I said, who is this guy? So I Googled him and I started watching his videos and I said, my gosh, he's fantastic. And this article is completely misrepresenting him. Mm. So that actually led me, and then I started reading more, um, you know, conservative, um, more conservative papers, which was eye-opening um, mm -hmm. to me. But yeah, and you know what surprised me too? I thought that all people who were sort of, you know, more conservative, that they all thought exactly the same way. But then I found that there was a lot more diversity in their opinions than what was being um shown in the um, mainstream, you know, so-called liberal media. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's a good point. I, and, and it's true. I mean, I guess if you can turn anybody into a boogeyman if you're just trying to sort of straw man their <laughs> perspectives or, you know, burn it in effigy. It's just mm -hmm. a caricature of itself. Uh, I wonder at what point did we really, at what point as, as a culture did we start to rely so much on broadcast sources to understand the world around us. Surely we can go back in, you know, the imagination of the modern person can, we can go back to a time when that wouldn't have been the case where there would have been maybe a newspaper circulating, but it might've even been a local newspaper and you would have just heard rumors about the bigger things happening in the world, but it wouldn't have been such an integral part of how we understand our lives. And mm. I've, I've taken this, I mean, I used to listen to NPR. That was kind of my main source was NPR for a long time. And I didn't, you know, this was when the conservatives would talk about the liberal media. And I would think this, that, that doesn't make any sense. This isn't biased. It seemed very 
uh, straightforward to me. At some point, I started to hear the bias and I got very turned off from it. I felt like I was listening to propaganda. And it was largely around medical issues for me was where this was. Um, because then that's a whole rabbit hole. I had a daughter who was vaccine injured in 20, in 2009, and it just kind of like woke me up to some, the way some things were not being discussed um, with proper nuance. There was, it felt like an untouchable subject that was, you have to think of it this way. And so I started to hear that in the, in the, like in, on NPR and the news sources that I was listening to, I started to hear this really black and white thinking. Um, but instead of switching to different media, I just turned media off and went into my own real life and stopped paying so much attention to world news. And I think that there's this, there's this sort of attitude, this pervasive attitude that if you're not clued into what's going on in, in the world, right, then you're somehow uninformed and unintelligent and you're a little bit backwards, but where does that come from? And, and is that so? <laughs> That's so true. That's so true. There is such a, a sort of, I don't know, stigma around just not being quite clued in or, or you know, a promotion of the idea that, oh, I mean, I, mean, I put on the news every night, I read the local paper. It's like, well, what are you really, what is your diet of, of news? And, and um, we, we were, we're coming on a lot more, uh, we have a lot more freedom to choose what diet we have now, I guess, don't we? um of what it is we we listen to and i don't know about you guys but if, if the local news comes on the tv it's normally something horrendous has happened or someone's house has been broken into and you kind of go hmm i'm not sure i need to listen to this actually i think i might turn this off while i'm eating my, my dinner or something you know um but 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 to your point about like i was, I was interested as you were talking leslie like what do, do you think when you realize that there's bias in this outlet that you've been trusting so much, is that a result of you having already heard some opinions elsewhere? Or is that is that just a, a natural moment in which you kind of go, hmm, I'm not sure that adds up. And then that starts you off on a different journey and then you maybe look at other outlets. Because I'm wondering if it needs to come first, like this, this sense of being a bit, a bit like you were saying, Jen, kind of like, I'm intrigued by this Jordan Peterson devil character. You know, I might go and have a look at that first. And then before you know it, you sort of taken on a bit more of that, that you've you exposed yourself to some more different points of view. It means that you're going to be less turned off when you hear something similar to that. Yeah, that's, it's a really good question. I think that there has to be some kind of seed planted, right? Yeah. If, if you've got the blinders on and you're just going down one path, trusting something, uh, what, what is the thing? Like, is it in Jennifer's case, just the sounds to, this guy sounds too evil. I'm really curious. <laughs> and then you <laughs> you read it and you're like, wait a minute. Um, and in, in my case, it was something that I, I don't know if it was a series of steps because there were other things. It wasn't like I was buying all of it. I had like, for, for instance, I always had my, this is going to, I'm going to have to go get my tinfoil hat now and put it on for this because <laughs> I've, I've just broken into several topics, but I, I had questions about 9-11, for instance, and I didn't, mm. I, I wasn't trusting the, the narrative around that. So I wasn't like I just hook, line and sinker bought everything. But this particular medical incident that happened in my family caused me to do an awful lot of my own reading and research. And, um, and I realized that there were inconsistencies and factual inconsistencies in the way that we were hearing news outlets talk about these issues that to me, just it's it, it shattered my trust mm -hmm. in the reporting because it it screamed propaganda to me. And as soon as I was that turned off, it was really hard to go. It was hard to listen to any of it anymore. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if I really answered your question. Yeah, no, I mean, it sounds then that you're maybe you develop and harnessed your you enhanced your ability to understand from your point of view does something logically make sense does this does this have anything in it that doesn't really you know and then motivating yourself to go and find out for yourself do your own research not trusting it not trusting the narrative just because it's come from some sort of um yeah mm -hmm. source mm -hmm. what about you david what was your what's your history with this uh... 
I mean, I, I, I guess, like I've just said, I started getting a bit suspicious of how useful it was knowing about keeping and keeping up to date with the news, mm-hmm. uh, as it were, as because I just realized how angry it made people. And I realized, um, I realized, I mean, I think I think there was a moment that happened once when I was out as a student in London and there was a there was a stabbing that happened in London Bridge. And I was at a, I was at a kind of um party in north london a long way from that and yeah and i went online and i could see all my friends from different parts of london sort of say sort of checking in and saying i'm safe and it was it, it was a horrible thing to have happened but it was the way that everyone this mass hysteria just kind of like spread and then i had my mum contacting me and my my brother to say are you safe and i thought you know like there was a stabbing that was quite brutal. It was, it was, it was, it was by uh, someone who I, I think had been escaped from a prison. So it had a bit of a story to it, but it was the way that this hysteria just flooded. And I remember thinking like, we've got to control and protect ourselves a little bit from that stuff because it made, for me, it made no sense that the whole of London was suddenly in, in hysterical, um, in a hysterical moment because of something that honestly happens quite frequently, but it was just the way it was reported. Mm-hmm. Um, and the way it was talked about and the way that people jumped on it and, and wanted to make it something that they could all be involved in. And, and I think, I mean, I'm not saying that's when I started becoming, that's probably one of the reasons I started coming off social media, to be honest. But um, I think uh, I think it started to make me question, what is it we spend our time, um, what's the information diet that we have, being quite conscious about that? Yeah, you know, that that reminds me a lot of, some sort of the growing awareness that I had <clears throat> when I was younger as well, of kind of the fear, it, fear porn is what we call it, you know, now mm. that's a common phrase, but it felt like you're hearing about tragedies. Like, I think I heard about that in London. I think we mm-hmm. had that all over our news cycle too. Mm-hmm. It sounds very familiar. Um, and we hear about these tragic events that happen in places that don't actually impact our own lives in any way and couldn't potentially impact our small little life here in in our locality because it happens across the world or across the country or whatever and they blow them up and talk about them and i think this generates this sense of hyper vigilance and fear in people Mm -hmm. and it's not a healthy thing to be feeding and i i can remember um a long time ago this would have been like the mid uh the mid aughts i was um listening to the radio, I was listening to my local, uh, one of my local talk radios, I don't know if it's NPR or whatever, but this, t- I don't think it was actually, it was a local station. And as a part of their promo, cause you know, they run like their little, uh, before the, the particular radio show comes on, they might do like the little jingle and some promotional canned stuff that they've done. They actually incorporated aspects of different news pieces that this announcer had covered. And they incorporated a particular incident that I won't tell you because it's so it was really shocking, but it was a bad thing, a really awful thing happening to a child at the hands of like the parent or something. But this, mm-hmm. and I could tell, I remember the story because it's seared into my brain, but I just won't go into it because I don't want to give anybody, I don't want to pass that on to anybody. But it was this really shocking, sad thing that happened, not even a local thing. And it had happened long enough ago that it was being canned and played back in this as a part of like the hard hitting news that this guy covers. Mm. And I thought, how gratuitous, you know? I mean, what are we doing here? You're, and I actually called and made a complaint about it because it was, uh, yeah, so for whatever that's worth, but I gave my feedback on it because it really shocked me that you would use somebody else's tragedy, some far flung and time distant tragedy to advertise the kind of things that you, you know, do on your show it's just exploitation mm. yeah that's the creepy part of the news when you feel like they're like oh good a tragedy <laughs> yes. yeah and I think it's their job to report the news but you just don't really want them salivating over it <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I used to be a big NPR listener too, and um, I loved it because you know how you get kind of attached to things that you listen to every day, you feel this sort of 
friendly sense that they're part of your small village, you know, when you hear the same voices over and over. I got quite turned off of them because um, I was listening one day and they were talking about the expression white tears and they were talking about it um, in a very approving way and saying that it was just a gentle chastisement. And that really turned me off. I, I was just thinking that, and that was before that term was being frequently used, but it just shocked me. And I thought that is not, there's nothing gentle about that. That is extremely hostile and racist. Mm -hmm. Well, it's horribly dehumanizing. Totally dehumanizing. And it seems like after that, NPR started just having more and more content of that type. And I no longer listen to them anymore at all because they can't go five seconds without saying something <laughs> about. It's gotten that bad, has it? It really is bad. Yeah. At least last time I tuned in, I just thought, oh, no point in this anymore. Yeah. yeah. I was just, I'm looking at the chat a little bit here. It, Bill Bob 7624 says NPR is big brother with a cup of coffee. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Peter Bogosian, uh, I can't read this name, Skol, Skolex UK. Peter Bogosian has done some great unpacking of the sad decline of NPR. I'll have to check that out because that's interesting. Yeah, that's really good. I've watched a lot of that. Oh, have you? Yeah. Yeah, and hello to everybody in the chat there. As Chris Freestone says, got to leave the echo chamber once in a while. CNY photo video says, through COVID, I lost trust in most media. I prefer my own lying eyes. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. And then um, CNY photo video also says, saw the photos of you guys in New York City. Looks like it was a great time. It really was. It was really super fun. Yeah, that's great. But it, it is interesting. I like the lying eyes comment because that's that kind of comes back to sort of that same sentiment that I've had where I, why must I be checked into this cycle mm. of somebody else telling me how the world works and what's going on in it? Why must I do that? And I, I have felt very, so much more balanced and happy as a person since I've left most social media and media in general, kind of as a peripheral aspect to my life. And I've gotten into community building within my own small sphere. Like I like to say, shrink the world back down to the size that it actually is you know and i so my most of my friends most of my <clears throat> social contacts are people that i really know and really see and really spend time with on a week to week basis and that has brought a lot more sanity to my life and made me feel more grounded i know we can't always do that because we have these contacts across far distances but i think that it it does help kind of focusing on what you can control versus what's outside of your control. You know, we can't control what's going on in Ukraine, for example, but maybe there's things we can do within our own lives to make things a bit better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that's that's the thing of realization I think I, I was talking about earlier of just sort of thinking, hang on a minute, you know, this news doesn't need to be sort of such a social contagion almost it, it can be or it doesn't need to be something that that, that that has such a wide widespread effect on all of us we can we still have the ability to live the real lives we have <laughs> day to day rather than having our mood influence so much and our sense of fear about the world and all of these these things that can get triggered by the news mm -hmm. um yeah i limit it an awful lot now I was just interested as well. What do you guys think about um, the fact that what we're doing now with with I think with the in inf information age that we're in, there's so much in the way of perspectives out there that do you think that we more rely upon um, trusted figures now to kind of dispense them? Or not just it's not like they're giving us the news. It's almost as if the news happens and then we have our trusted kind of they're almost like filters. We have we have the news and then I don't know, I, I, I like listening to trigonometry. <laughs> um, they do a lot of uh, breakdowns of what's happening. So the news kind of goes through them and then I get to hear their opinion and it feels um, 
you know, it's not being, it just feels like I've, at least it's the bias that, that I understand and I can relate to. It's not completely unbiased, but it's one that I know and I'm aware of. And it's one that's more entertaining and all that sort of stuff as well. But I find myself more relying upon those trusted figureheads or like uh, intellectual minds to kind of like distill it into something that I can digest myself. Yeah, it's kind of a an heuristic, right? So it's like you don't have time to consume all of this stuff and process all of that. But if you mm. know somebody who did, it's kind of I, I it makes me think my first, I guess, trusted filter growing up was always my dad. I didn't have time to process everything and I didn't understand the world, but my dad did. And if I asked him what he thought about something, he would tell me and I felt like that was good enough for me. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, there's, there's, to some extent we have to rely on other people for certain things because we just don't have time to process the volume of information that comes at us. But I do, I think that there can be an over-reliance on, on that expert because it makes our own critical thinking skills lazy and flabby. And so hmm. we, we don't take the time to evaluate things for ourselves and we can end up relying too heavily on, on someone else. And then we can kind of do that splitting thing, I think, where the source is all good. And so we're gonna take everything. And then as yeah. soon as they fail us once, they're all bad. And so- Yeah, yeah. That's so interesting. I think I think that's been happening. That's happened with Sam Harris for me recently with his, you know, the, that, that was, yeah, that was, he was someone that I used to like listening to his podcast, the way he talked about things. And then and he was probably a good a good filter. And now, you know, with his his kind of yeah fierce protection or defensive of his positions without it's just kind of put me off completely. <laughs> yeah. yeah, when you see somebody else's blind spot you think wow are they are they a reliable source anymore or is everything about you know are there the flaws do the flaws how deep do these go but yeah it's good to remember that i think this is like that conversation we had about jordan peterson we were talking about how or maybe this was in my group i think this was in one of my groups we were talking about jordan peterson and about um how uh there's certain aspects of his demeanor or his arguments that some people have found really off-putting and I think that just serves as a reminder that nobody's your 100%. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. And if a topic is really, really important to you, try to read about it widely mm -hmm. and look at several different sources so that you can synthesize the information and the various opinions for yourself. Of course, we can't do that with everything. We don't have time. But if something's really important and it's impacting your life, I think expose yourself to different sources. Mm -hmm. um, I, I saw a couple of comments that that were interesting. Marby Dog says, I can't do NPR or PBS. The propaganda is so naked now. And then Jen X-Ray says, I have listened to it for years and it it is embarrassing how childish NPR can be. They used to actually be inform informative and give different perspectives. And both of those comments remind me uh, well, they, they, they seem to be speaking to something that I feel like I've noticed as well, which is an uptick in how heavy, like there's people who say, I saw this coming for years, the, it was written on the wall, you just didn't see it because you were blind because you were in, in these liberal echo chambers. And maybe there is something to that, but also I feel like there's been a massive increase, a dramatic increase in how blatant the propaganda is over the past. Oh, I guess. Oh yeah. I mean, NPR has always been liberal leaning, but I feel like they used to present a bit more of a balanced view. I, 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 I've never really listened. I, I listened to like one podcast that was an NPR podcast. So I don't really have a lot of history personally with NPR, but listening to Peter Bogosian's uh, program on YouTube, if you want to call it that, he, he, it's, it is striking. The, the, the language they use for anyone that seems to disagree or anyone that's slightly, like, uh, I don't know, slightly right of left, far left liberal is described as far right. They, they you seem to use the expression far right all the time. Mm -hmm. It's this real easy opportunity to just kind of go, this is a bad opinion. To all you guys listening, this is a bad opinion. Now we're going to get into the opinion, you know, and that's just lazy. 
And that also speaks to that polarization. Like Jen, you were talking about balance, like they used to present a balance. And now I think that in media, what we're used to seeing as balance is this like, we're gonna present both sides as if there's two sides like this. Like we have this, these people think that it's, you know, this color and this people think it's this color and never the twain shall meet. There's no rainbow of spectrum of, of ideas here. And I think that that's, it's just, how did we get to this point where we don't discuss things in their fullness? Like there isn't balance, there's just a opposition. Far right, yeah. radical left. Yeah, is that, is that splitting that you were saying earlier, Leslie? That's, that's the splitting that goes on. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're either with us or against us, black and white thinking. We, we have that, it, that crops up everywhere in our, in our lives, doesn't it, that splitting? I'm seeing it more and more, but it definitely happens there. Corpus says, what's the topic for today? I think, well, we started out talking about kind of community, but we ended up talking more about media and how to trust, who, who to trust. So it's, that's pretty much been the topic we've been working on. It's interesting. I feel like we could talk about this for a long time, but just scratch the surface. If you want to talk about different points of view and bring your different points of view, then come along to our community groups. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> that, absolutely. <laughs> well, I guess we all have kind of a heart out. So it's time to wrap up, uh, wrap it up. Anybody have any final thoughts? No, I have group at two today if anyone wants to join. 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern. Time. Eastern. Which Thank is you. 11 uh, Pacific, and I don't know what time, uh, 7 in the UK? 7 p.m. GMT, yeah. All right. Well, it's lovely to see you all, and uh, thanks to everybody who's been in the chat, and look forward to seeing you next Monday, and maybe in the groups. Thanks, Kevin. Bye. Bye, all. Mm.